amazing really when you look for the, at the longevity of Vic Catroni, someone who was active in the underworld in the 1930s and then you fast forward four decades and he's still major, major, major player in, in Montreal. Every time you want to see me, I'm alone all the time. I don't know about it. Right. Vincenzo Vic Catroni is one of the most notorious and powerful figures in the history of the Montreal Mafia. He was a mastermind of organized crime, known for his ruthlessness and incredible ability to control and manipulate the underworld. His legacy as the godfather of Montreal has left a significant mark on the history of organized crime in Canada. Let's get into it. Vincenzo was born in Mamola, Calabria, Italy in 1911. He lived in Europe for 13 years until his family migrated to Quebec, Canada in 1924. The Catroni family came to Canada with four children, Vincenzo, his brother Giuseppe, and their two sisters. The family size would later grow even further with the birth of two more boys, Frank and Michelle. As immigrants in an unknown country with a large family, Vincenzo's father struggled to make ends meet. The family had no choice but to live in one of the poorest and most dangerous neighborhoods in Montreal. The neighborhood was riddled with crime, and it was easy to see why a young man with a struggling family could be easily influenced to follow the wrong path. Since his father's income was not enough to take care of the family, Vincenzo had to start hustling in his teenage years to pitch in. The responsibility taken on by the young man prevented him from going to school. Vincenzo joined his father's carpentry business for a while, but when he got older and stronger, he made a career change and started working as a professional wrestler using the name Vic Vincent. He would soon begin working on other ventures during the Prohibition. The Prohibition happened in the United States and was in effect for 13 years, running from 1920 to 1933. The constitutional law implemented throughout the country banned the production, importation, transportation, and sale of alcoholic beverages. Before this, the United States manufactured and produced quite a variety of alcohol meaning there was a market of millions of people already addicted to the product. The prohibition also extended to Canada, but it was not as thorough, since it was legal to drink alcohol in Quebec, making Montreal the headquarters for bootlegging, which is the process of manufacturing and smuggling alcohol illegally. All of this was going on in the United States, while Catroni was a teenager struggling to make a dollar as a wrestler. Catroni's wrestling teacher, Armand Corville, introduced a young man to the business. The quick money to be made by bootlegging was far too tempting, and Catroni helped smuggle alcohol to the United States. Vincenzo continued his career as a professional wrestler, however, when he wasn't training or performing, he was engaged in criminal activities on the side. He often possessed and spent counterfeit money, as well as him being involved with violent crimes like theft, assault, and battery. By the age of 20, Catroni had already amassed a lengthy list of minor offenses, as well as engaging in bootlegging. The crime in Montreal was so bad that in the 1930s, the French police listed the city as the world's third most depraved city. Apart from the highly thriving business of bootlegging, the city was also a den for prostitution. It is reported that the underworld industry of Montreal was worth $200 million a year back in 1936. Although Vincenzo was no stranger to making money illegally, he spent most of his life as a young man working as a guard and a bouncer. With his background in wrestling, Catroni was able to work at different gambling houses and bars while simultaneously staying in touch with the criminal underworld. Together, Catroni and Corville worked under the Quebec Liberal Party and the Union Nationale, not as congressmen or political advisors, but as a part of their party's muscle. Catroni was the guy to call if corrupt political parties needed to take care of opposition supporters. During his run as the muscle guy for the parties, Vic was involved with depressing the votes of rival parties by beating up supporters, often with baseball bats. Initially, Catroni and Corville were the Quebec Liberal Party's muscle, however, when his party lost to the Union Nationale in 1936, Vic and Corville switched their allegiances. Catroni was good at his job and his family was rewarded by staying under the protection of Quebec politicians. Authorities turned a blind eye to their dealings, and politicians used their extensive resources to cover for the family. This convenient protection lasted for decades. In the late 1930s, at 27 years old, Vincenzo Catroni retired from professional wrestling and went full-time into his underworld endeavors. Before we continue, I've got a quick word to share from the incredible online safety service and this video sponsor, Aura. Anyone can find anything on the internet, including your name, email, home address, phone number, and even your relatives. 
This information is accessible because of data brokers who profit by selling your information to robocallers, telemarketers, spammers, and anyone else that wants to learn more about you. That's where Aura comes in. It will identify data brokers that are exposing your information and automatically submit opt-out requests on your behalf. Also, your emails and passwords will be monitored to see if they were involved in a data breach and gives you recommendations on what to do. Aura has almost every internet safety tool you'll ever need. It features a VPN, password manager, real-time credit and identity theft monitoring, internet parental controls, and protects your devices from malware. Let Aura do the hard work of keeping you safe online. Go to Aura.com slash HUD Chronicles or click the link in the description below or scan the QR code to try two weeks for free. Now let's get back into the story. In 1941, Catroni purchased a bar and nightclub called the Faison Dore and the Café Royal. The Faison Dore became the most famous nightclub in Montreal between the 1940s and 1960s, mainly due to the notable figures that frequently visited the bar and the many European stars who performed there. Vincenzo's popularity grew in the community as a successful businessman, and in 1953, his status as a significant player in the criminal underworld was confirmed when he began working with Carmen Galante of the Bonanno crime family. The Bonanno criminal organization is one of the five mafia families that control illicit activities in New York City and throughout the United States as a part of the criminal enterprise referred to as the American Mafia. Galante representing the Bonanno family arrived in Montreal and met Catroni to discuss the potential of running a heroin business in the city. Galante didn't go to Montreal only for his heroin business. He also ran different gambling rings in the city, and it's estimated by authorities that Galante collected profits worth $50 million every year from 1956 to 1963. The entire time that Galante was establishing his roots in Canada, Catroni was with him. Catroni's association with Galante enhanced his standing in the criminal underworld and provided him with the connections to New York that he had always desired. Galante formally established the Bonanno family's Decina in Montreal, appointing Catroni as a Capo Decina. As Capo Decina, Catroni was in charge of Bonanno's heroin business in Montreal, and the city became a crucial smuggling hub in the French Connection smuggling network. Opium from Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Iran, known as the Golden Crescent, was smuggled through Turkey to Marseille, where the gangsters of Lim Mew converted it into heroin. From Marseille, the heroin was then smuggled into North America, with Montreal serving as one of the primary entry points. Antonio, a powerful French gangster and one of France's top heroin smugglers, listed Catroni's nightclub as his mailing address. But Galante's antics did not go unnoticed, and there was a new threat to the business. This threat was John Drapeau of the Civic Party of Montreal. John was an incorruptible man that was unshakable in his goal to improve the condition of Montreal by wiping out all criminal organizations in the city. In 1954, Catroni resorted to election manipulation to prevent John from getting elected as Montreal's mayor. He sent thugs to oppress supporters of the Civic Party of Montreal, and his men even stuffed ballot boxes with fake votes. Despite Catroni's efforts, John emerged victorious in the election. His initial action was to appoint an honest police officer, Pacific Roy Plant, as the chief of the Montreal Police Department. Plant exerted pressure on the federal government to deport Galante, citing his lack of an official source of income or employment. It worked. In April 1956, Galante was deported back to the United States. However, shortly after, the Bonanno family replaced Colante with Salvatore, that went with the alias Little Sal. Catroni's run under the Quebec Liberal Party and the Union Nationale gave him a deep understanding of the inner runnings of politics, and he continued to live in that world well into the 1950s. During the 1957 municipal election, the Catroni family aligned themselves with Premier Maurice Duplis' Union Nationale government to oppose the re-election of John. John's goal to reduce the influence of Montreal's criminal underworld was detested by Vic, and the Capo de Chino was willing to do whatever it took to prevent the mayor from winning re-election. The Catroni family sent their soldiers to take care of the major. The men attempted to run John over with a car, while also vandalizing his campaign headquarters and assaulting Ruben, the president of the Civic Action League, in public. Despite the widespread violence and fear instilled in John's supporters, Catroni's preferred candidate, Fournier, still required 20,000 fraudulent ballots 
to secure his eventual victory. Once Fournier became mayor, he promptly demoted and dismissed Pont, the police chief appointed by John replacing him with the more corrupt individual. But Plant could not rest easy in Montreal, as he was plagued with death threats. The ex-police chief fled to a remote Mexican village in fear for his life. Without upright leadership in the city, corruption subsequently surged once again in Montreal, and Bonanno's new representative was bolder in his dealings. However, he was a little too bold. Little Sal was caught under federal jurisdiction with 240 undeclared Cuban cigars upon his return from Cuba. The situation led to his deportation by the federal government. Tired of different deportations of their representatives, Joseph Bonanno appointed Catroni as his new agent in Montreal. During the peak of Catroni's illicit gambling operations, law enforcement officials estimated that his American contacts, the Bonanno family, skimmed off approximately $50 million annually as their share from an $83 million total fund generated on one of Catroni's four illegal fronts. In fact, in the 1960s and 1970s, Catroni also had control of a bookmaking network in the Ottawa Hall area that handled around $50,000 in bets per day. As Catroni aged, he passed on his enforcement responsibilities to his younger brother, Frank. Frank Catroni was two decades younger than Vincenzo, but he shared his brother's volatile tendency to use violence. Although his brother Frank managed the family business, Vincenzo was still very active. In the 1960s, Vic was a completely different man. From starting from the very bottom, in the poorest neighborhood of Montreal, to becoming the proud owner of a bar and nightclub, to purchasing a home furnished with the best materials available at the time, Vic was finally freed from the challenges of his youth. However, trouble would soon come his way. In 1964, Vic faced a predicament when his friend and superior, Joseph Bonanno, the boss of the Bonanno crime family, challenged the commission, a governing board of the American Mafia created in 1931. Bonanno had a falling out with three fellow commission members, Carlo Gambino of New York, Stefano Magadino of Buffalo, and Tommy Lucchese of New York, and plotted their murders. Bonanno was summoned to appear before the commission to explain himself, but sensing that he might be killed if he showed his face, he fled to Montreal. Bonanno's unexpected arrival placed Vic in a difficult position of having to choose between serving his boss, Bonanno, or the commission, both of whom he wished to remain loyal to. The commission was willing to pardon Bonanno for his violation of their regulations and wanted him to come back to New York. They sent Sam, the plumber, to persuade Bonanno to return to New York numerous times, but Bonanno refused to acknowledge the commission's authority, a situation that Sam deemed to be the greatest disrespect. Catroni's attempts to remain neutral were strained. The leader of the Buffalo crime family in western New York, Stefano, perceived Bonanno's presence in Montreal as an indication of his desire to trespass on his territory in southern Ontario, resulting in threats from Buffalo that Catroni should sever ties with Bonanno if he wishes to survive. Catroni was receiving threats from different organizations, and they were all because of his loyalty to Bonanno. However, Vic would soon be relieved as Bonanno was deported back to the United States later in the same year. Although Catroni managed to evade the law during most of his career, he couldn't entirely hide his connections to the criminal underworld, and the Canadian news magazine known as McLean wrote a piece a year earlier, in 1963, dubbing Vincenzo Catroni as the godfather of Montreal. Catroni didn't like bad publicity, and he regarded McLean's paper against him as a libel against him, claiming they tried to damage his reputation. In 1972, Catroni initiated his libel lawsuit against McLean, suing the magazine company for $1,250,000 in damages. The representative for McLean, A.J. Campbell, adopted an aggressive stance by pointing out that Catroni maintained close ties with Joseph Bonanno, the notorious gangster from New York, who was a co-founder of the commission. Campbell also brought up different pieces of evidence that revealed bribery on Vincenzo's part. In the end, the judge concluded that Catroni's reputation was far from clean, and instead of the $1,250,000 attempted, the judge only gave him a ridiculous total of $2. This libel case prompted the government to further question Vincenzo's influence in Montreal's organized crime. In 1974, Catroni was summoned to appear before the Quebec government's inquiry on organized crime. The commission found Catroni's testimony deliberately ambiguous, unfocused, and unclear, leading to his imprisonment for one year on a contempt charge. 
During his testimony, Gatroni repeatedly claimed that he had no authority, and that his associates were simply friends with whom he had no formal meetings. It was only after several months in jail that Catroni's lawyer was able to reverse the verdict. Later that same year, Vic and Paolo Violi, the Catroni family's underboss, were overheard on a police wiretap threatening to kill notorious Hamilton mob boss Johnny Papilia and demanding $150,000 after he used their names during a $300,000 extortion plot without their permission and without cutting them a portion of the earnings. On April 30th, 1974, Vic and Violi met with Papilia at the Reggio bar owned by Violi. When Papilia denied using the name of the Catroni family, Vincenzo casually told him, let's hope so, because we'll kill you. Papilia responded with a sense of fear that was quite unusual for him, saying, I know you'll kill me Vic, I believe you'll kill me. Sources claimed that Papilia had broken down in fear at the meeting and was terrified of Vincenzo. At the time, the Calabrian faction, led by Vincenzo Catroni, was challenged by the rival Sicilian factions, competing for control of Montreal's underworld. This was the beginning of a violent conflict that lasted for several years, with extensive consequences for the power relations of the clans until the 2000s. The conflict was marked by a series of violent attacks and murders, with both sides fighting for control of the Montreal underworld. In 1978, Paolo Violi was assassinated, marking a turning point in the turf war, as the Violi faction was effectively eliminated, leaving the Catroni family vulnerable. Other prominent figures who were also involved in the Montreal Mafia War included Johnny Papalia, who was allied with the Calabrian faction. Papalia reportedly supplied the Calabrian faction with weapons and other resources during the turf war, and coordinated attacks against the rival Sicilian faction. Following the late 1970s, old age was catching up with Catroni, and even though he often claimed to suffer from different ailments whenever he was charged to court, this time, Vincenzo Catroni was actually sick. His brother, Frank Catroni, temporarily assumed the role of acting boss for his ill brother, despite his own incarceration from 1975 to 1979. And on September 16, 1984, Vincenzo passed away from cancer at the age of 73. In the 1980s following the death of Vincenzo and Paolo, Vito Rizzuto reportedly emerged as the new leader of the Montreal Mafia and created a power shift that led to the Rizzuto organization taking control of the existing Mafia organization from Vincenzo. The Rizzuto organization would go on to become one of the most powerful and influential criminal organizations in Canadian history, with extensive ties to other Mafia families in the US and Italy. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video and want to see more like this in the future. Also comment down below letting us know what you'd like to see next. Thanks for watching and have a good one.